What's up, everybody? Uh, Pastor Cal here with Jim Limbach. Um, What's up, Cal? Welcome. Hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I haven't seen you in so long. Um, welcome to this week's Connect Group lesson. For those of you uh, who may not know, Connect Groups are a thing that we do. Basically, groups in church get together and read the Bible and learn a lesson and talk about that and just other kinds of whatever else is happening in life. And they kind of live life together in the church and so the church is not really a building it is people a global movement of all those who believe in jesus but also those locally who gather together and so we can gather in person or online so this is our online connect group so we intend for you to watch these with um with, with others, you can watch them alone. If you're watching alone and you said, that's it, Cal, I'm not gonna watch one ever again because you said you had to watch it in groups. That's not quite what I mean is we intend these to be something that happens in community. And so you can ask questions as you're watching. You can, you can have a friend who you think would need to hear this and you can watch it with them. Maybe you're a part of a connect group in our church, but you're not meeting together right now, you know, for all the issues that are going on you could still watch this lesson together and meet and you could talk about it, discuss it. You can pause at any time and you can maybe go, man, that was dumb what Cal just said. Or you could say, we're pausing it and we're gonna say, I wanna go a little more into that question that you just asked and talked about and see what I what I think about it, what my group might wanna discuss. So um, you kinda use this lesson the way that you need to in your life. So with all that being said, Jim, we're gonna begin. Let's do it. So our lesson this week is about Jesus and that he forgives, okay? He forgives us. And so we're going to talk about what that means. Forgiven, why do we have to, why do we need that forgiveness? What does that mean, right? So in Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26. That's page uh, 91. Page lost, lost 91. Page. Yeah. 91. Page 91. No, no problem go. whatsoever. Yeah. And so um, as, as we're... Um, going over this lesson and teaching out of the Bible and talking, the main idea of this lesson, as always, the main idea is Jesus has the power to forgive sin. Jesus has the power to forgive sin. So all that we're talking about today is going to lead to that idea. So uh, just keep that in your mind as we're going through things. So we'll start off with a question, Jim. Um, what are the most common ways people describe Jesus? What are the most common ways that people describe Jesus? Yeah, so I think you could take this a couple ways, right? So are we talking about people who maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus? Or are we talking about all these fine folks who are watching and love Jesus and are watching? They love him so much, they're watching a connect group online. Yeah. Um, but I think the question is geared more at like just generally. Like what what is the, the world kind of yeah, say who Jesus is? General um, beliefs about Jesus. Yeah, and I think, you know, you hear things like, well, he was a good man. Uh, he was a good teacher. He was a, he was a kind person. Uh, he was a loving person. Uh, he was a rabbi. Um, he was a mentor to some. Those are really, I think, when you're talking about people who don't have that saving knowledge of Jesus, those are the ways that they describe who he is. Yeah, so, you so, know. So people that may not necessarily, you know, deny that he was, that he had existed, right? Because historically, it's, you really, you can't argue with that. It's what, where you take it from there, so. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. no, that's yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think you pointed out that like in general, the general view of Jesus is positive, like a warm, friendly way of looking at him. Even people who don't agree with Christianity or don't like some of our beliefs, they tend to not really, really hate on Jesus. You yeah. know, yeah. Now there are some folks that 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 uh, believe he wasn't real, like he yeah. never lived. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of a minority view. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so, you know, what do these common descriptions reveal about how you you may look at Jesus and what you expect of Jesus? Yeah, that's I think that's the real question, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the things that, not to get off subject, but that I think is a more effective question than asking people, do you believe in God or do you believe in Jesus, is what do you believe mm -hmm. about Jesus? I think that reveals more about where mm -hmm. they are spiritually. Um, but, you know, I think they expect most people who don't have that, that saving knowledge of Jesus, they expect him to teach them kind of how to live a good moral life, right? mm -hmm. how to be a good person, how to be kind to people, how to be a good husband, how to be a good father. How He's to like be a, a role model. Yeah, yeah. Again, just kind of a, 
you know, I don't, and I'm not, not hating on anybody who has a life coach, but, but kind of like a life coach, right? Mm-hmm. If I just do the things that Jesus tells me to do, then I'll have a good life, mm-hmm. which is true it, for the most part, you know, depending on how you define a good life. Um, you'll live a better life, I believe, and we believe if you follow Jesus. But mm-hmm. I think people are, uh, kind of look to him generally, you know, that if I follow his teachings, then things are going to go well for me. Yeah. yeah. So general life instruction. Right? Yeah. Jesus yeah. kind of morally good has, has the yeah. way, right? Yeah. yeah. So our first passage in this session is Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. On one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of, of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in him. Just then some men came carrying on a stretcher, a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the tiles, through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Jesus is, is doing what Jesus did when he had a ministry on, on earth. So a ministry, a way of living life where he taught people about God and the work that he did was to explain to people who God is and what God is, what he wants to do, what is happening through Jesus, right? So his ministry. And so he's ministering, teaching, and there are people who gathered to hear him, right? And of the group there were, um, were, were kind of like the elites in his world. So they were religious people. They were very educated. They could read. They could write. They actually owned scrolls, which would be evidence of wealth. So they could study the Bible. They could... Um, you know, you know, write it out, memorize it, and whatnot. So uh, these are like are like educated religious people, the ones who would have been looked at as as the upper echelon in, in their world, right? So amidst the crowds of those who came to hear Jesus were elites like this, okay? And Luke points out to us that um, Jesus was there, right? But that something special was going on. That the power of God was in Jesus. Now, if you're a Christian and you hear that, you go, wait a minute, Cal. Jesus is God. He, he is divine. And so, so that is true. And this has been an issue that historically through all of Christianity, we're talking like 2,000 years now, has been discussed in what way is he divine? In what way is, it, is he human? And so there's kind of rough, you know, like, like beliefs that are on the outer edges that aren't really what scripture speaks about. And then it's kind of like a broad middle of, there's different theories about how he is God and how he is human, right? And they all have to do with what's called hypostasis, right? Hypostasis, right? So the argument is within mainstream Christianity is that Jesus somehow has this core substance of who he is that is intrinsically related to the Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity has this kind of hypostatic quality or hypostasis that would make them all to be divine, right? And so you have in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, Jesus meaning that, and the Holy Spirit, right? And they have one substance, one essence where they are divine, but they are also individual in how they work. And so this kind of gets a little bit into that. And the Lord's power to heal was in Jesus. But if Jesus is God and God has the power to create and heal and, and whatnot, then of course Jesus would have the power to heal. But remember, Jesus came to earth in the incarnation at Christmas with Mary and Joseph and everything. And so he, he was human like we are human. But also, although he's like us, he's not totally like us, right? So this is called kenosis, okay, which just means the process of emptying, that somehow Jesus, because he wanted to listen to his Father in heaven, he came to, to earth, he humbled himself into a servant, and he emptied himself according to the f- f- Father's plan mm. for him. And then according to the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Father, what was empty went back into him, right? And so how does this work? We'll get a pot of coffee on and get a comfy couch and we can talk for like a thousand hours. 
I can't explain everything. I don't even fully understand. What I'm trying to, to help us understand here is, is that Jesus was doing ministry according to God's will for him and that he was human and divine and the power of God was on him to do a great work that, you know, being human, I just could not do. Makes sense? Clear as mud. Absolutely. Clear as mud. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, All right. It is. It's, it, and I think there's, I mean, what the point here is that there's some things we're not going to understand. And Completely we, understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we could, we could talk about it, but that's, we, we'd miss the point of what we're doing here, but we have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I struggle with these things, these questions. So if you struggle, you're not alone. You're not alone. And yeah. these discussions looking for answers can actually help you to gain a, a great appreciation for Jesus coming to earth, the incarnation, what it means. But to not know all the answers, to be confused, should not cause you to say, well, I just don't believe anymore or I don't feel close to God because that's not a rational or proper response. Yeah. It should give you an appreciation for the complexity, but also the, the, the easily comprehensible nature of that Jesus lived was here and people knew him and saw him and wrote about him and we can ascertain that and we can trust who God is based on those accounts. Yeah. So it's like a both and, right? right. Yeah. So but it's good to kind of hop off the normal path yeah. and get into the weeds yeah. a little bit, you know? So Jesus is there and and the, you know Luke kind of leads in that that there was going to be a healing, right? And some men, these men come in, okay? And these men are carrying their friend, okay, on a stretcher. And the word the Greek word here is for like the man is on a stretcher and his and like his limbs, his legs, his arms, they don't work in a way where they would have been like weakened over time to not work properly. So like a neurological problem. So th this helps us understand this this man is, is is like lame. He's like handicapped. His his legs and arms aren't moving correctly. It's not like, oh, I'm tired and need some water and some rest and I'll get back up and move. Because of Real, real problems in how he is made. He he is not able to move like a normal human would move, right? So that's the idea here. So they try to bring this man in the house where Jesus is, and they can't get inside because of all the crowds watching, right, Jim? And so because they could not get in the house, they got on the roof and they dug a hole in the <laughs> roof and they lowered the guy in on this uh, stretcher into the middle of the house, those crowds around Jesus. So it was a packed house, right? And all this happened. It's a, this is incredibly theatrical and climactic. <laughs> you're sitting there and you hear the scratching noise and there's like crumbs, little, you know, they're in the air and stuff. What, what's that? And the roof starts to fall in and then you see like, you see open air and above you and this, and, and this man gets lowered in on a stretcher or a mountain. I mean, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would say. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I would say wow, right? <laughs> And so Jesus is going to show by healing this man the inner change that he is able to cause. And he's going to explain that by producing a change, like an, like an outward change. It's really cool what happens. You can, you can know the inside change has occurred because of the evidence of the outside change. Okay, our next passage is Luke chapter 5, verses 20 through 24. Seeing their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. Excuse me, friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks, who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. This climactic story is continuing to be very, like, very charged and high energy, right? And so Jesus, this is really cool, guys. I hope everyone's, you know, just really honed in here. Jesus sees these friends lower their friend into the house, this man who was lame and could not walk. And he looked at what was going on, and he saw their faith. He saw their faith. Notice how action is married here, tied together with faith. Mm -hmm. These men believed in Jesus and brought their friend, and against the odds, made a way for their friend to be seen by Jesus. And the friend, who was in a position, I would say, is pretty exposed 
vulnerable. There's crowds around. He's being lowered through a roof. It's, mm. it's just amazing, mm. right? And Jesus looks at him and says, friend, your sins are forgiven. When someone's your friend, they're on equal terms with you. You have a relationship with them. You're not speaking as if you're above them. You're speaking to them in a very like honest, open way. Jesus looks at him and says, you're not my enemy. You're not a problem. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, what is sin? Mm. What is sin, Jim? Well, it's, well, it's in its essence, it's our, it's our nature, right? So we're born mm-hmm. with this sin nature, but it's anything we do that's, that's displeasing to God against, goes against what God has for us. Um, li- not living our lives as an enemy of God, really, mm-hmm. is what sin is. Yeah, so you, you just not living how God wants you to live, right? Living outside of the plan of God in your life, right? So that is what it means to sin. So, friend, your sins are forgiven. So now the religious elites, right, the scribes and the Pharisees here, they began to think, and I think it's very rational and reasonable what they were doing, they began to think to themselves, who is this man, Jesus, who speaks blasphemies? Who speaks blasphemies? Now, a blasphemy, right, is anything that would distract or detract or minimize the nature of God and who God is. So for, you know, to, to kind of explain this, these, these, these leaders who, who were very, very strict about keeping the law did not like to handle Roman money. And why did they not want to handle Roman money? Because whose image is on a Roman... Whose image is on the coin, the Roman? Caesar. Caesar. Mm. And who did Caesar claim to be? God. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be a divinity, right? So in some way for Caesar to equate himself, even on a lower level with, with the gods, with divinity, would have been blasphemous, right? It detracts from the one true God. So they, they didn't even want to be associated with it by handling money, mm. right? And so they're in their mind understand that only the one true God can deal with sin, can even, can even like address the issue of sin, more or less forgive sin, right? And so they are th- thinking in their minds all this, okay? And who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus perceives their thoughts and he replies to them, why are you thinking this in your heart? Now Luke can he can understand what they were thinking because of how Jesus responds, right? Mm-hmm. He can understand. Why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier, for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, you get up and walk, right? But so you may know, so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told this man, paralyzed man, <laughs> three things three commands, to get up, take your stretcher, and go home. And the man was healed, a man who neurologically could not move for very complicated reasons. He got up and he walked. It's an amazing thing, right? So which is easier? Which is easier to go, hey, this kind of inner reality of you that you sin is forgiven? Because, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to see sin. I can see the evidence of sin, but like, can you... You go to a laboratory and go, hey, I got some sin here. Can you test it for me <laughs> and tell me about it? You can't do that, right? Yeah. No, you cannot. You cannot do that, right? <laughs> yeah. And so sin is something we cannot see. We can see the impact of sin, what, yeah. what happens because of it, but we cannot actually see sin. So which is easier? Jesus is putting everything on the line about his ministry here. Yeah. How can I be from God and do these things yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot going on here. Yeah. I think it's really cool. You know, you, like you said, you can't see sin. You can see the evidence of sin. In the same way, you can't see faith, but you can see the evidence of faith, just like with these guys. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know, it's kind of a neat little No, it, it, it is, right? And, and that's important because Christianity should actually look like something, yeah. right? All these various ways. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of get into why this was problematic for Jesus and why he was really putting himself on the line here, right? Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, 
or prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be executed, put to death. Wow. Hmm. So Jesus here is, is acting as a prophet. He's in a crowded household, right? He's surrounded. He can't get out. Hmm. And he does this amazing thing. Son, your sins are forgiven. He calls this guy his friend. And then he criticizes the leaders and the elite that have influence with this crowd. And he says, so you can know that the Son of Man, we'll get to that in a moment, has the power to forgive sins, then get up, take your mat, and walk. Now, what if this man didn't get up? This is crazy, right? Yeah. Jesus could have been executed for this, yeah. right there. I mean, how could he get away from this crowd? So he really put it on the line as a prophet when speaking on behalf of God, right? He really put it out there, right? So the Son of Man, who is this Son of Man? Daniel chapter 7, 13 through 14. 14. And this is an experience that Daniel the prophet had of God and very hard to understand things. But here's what he describes. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he approached the ancient of days, which is a which is a way of describing uh God, excuse me, he approached the Ancient of Days and he was led into his presence, the presence of God. And this Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Mm. I'm a son, you're a son. If you're a human being, you are a child, right? That's the way this works, right? And so mm. one like a son of man, one like a human, but clearly mm. not exactly like a human, okay? So one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. The clouds of heaven in the Bible indicate the movement of God. You see a storm rolling in when it's hot. You're like, oh, that's scary. Time to get inside. Put the lawn chairs up. You know, it's getting windy out here. The clouds are coming. The judgment and power of God is rolling through. And so who rides on the clouds of heaven in Scripture? It's God, the Father, right? But this one, like a son of man, like a human, is, is on the clouds of heaven coming. And he approaches the very presence of God the Father, right? And was led into his presence. Wow. And was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Was given all the things that belong to God the Father alone. And he will be worshipped by all the nations of the world. All the peoples. Everybody. That's real diversity right there. <laughs> and his dominion is everlasting. And his kingdom will never end or be destroyed. And so, so you will know the, the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. You get up. You take your stretcher or your mat, and you go home. That's Jesus. He is that son of man, and he is a true prophet of God. He is all of these things. And so Jesus is explaining what dominion he has. He has dominion in our lives to handle our sin problem. He forgives our sins, the, the inner unseen problem. And this miracle shows that he also has the power to change the world, the physical world. So our real problem is a spiritual problem, and then it manifests in our material, physical world, right? Brokenness happens as a result of our sin in our bodies, in our world, and then our relationship between us and our world, meaning like animals, other people, everything else, right? Mm -hmm. All you gotta, you have to you, you vote, and you, and you drive in traffic, and you can see the amount of war we have in our, in our world, right? And so this evidence is what is wrong with us, and it points to our human problem. The real core problem all of us have is there is a problem between our relationship with, with us and our Creator. That's the fundamental problem of life. So a lot going on here, but Jesus, hmm, is it, is it, he's explaining to us who he is, what he's all about. So, Jim, how does the true identity of Jesus come into conflict with people's preconceived ideas about him? Yeah. 
we discussed earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the issue is that you know if if you believe that Jesus was a good man and a good teacher and a and a you know a kind person, a moral uh, authority, um, then you got to reconcile that with Scripture, mm-hmm. right? If, if you think that's all he was, again, he was those things. But then you've got you've got passages of scripture where you know Jesus makes these claims about himself, right? So like in John ten, he says, "I and the Father are one." Right? He's mm-hmm. clearly saying, "I'm I'm God." Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're the same. Um, in John chapter six, where he talks about, you know, this is where you, you just can't say, "Well, he was just a good person," right? Where he talks about, "If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have eternal life." Mm-hmm. Like how how can a good person, a good moral, ethical person, say that mm-hmm. if it's not true? Right. So I think that's where this this uh, this conflict starts is that you can believe all these things that you want to believe about him. But if you actually read what the scriptures say about him and what he says about himself in the scriptures, you, you got to do something with that. Mm-hmm. You can't can, you can't read that and then continue to say he was a good man, good person, good teacher, good leader. Yeah. So you 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 absolutely have to wrestle with scripture because yeah. we go to scripture to understand who Jesus is. And you don't get to pick and choose. And and you can imagine the audience that would have heard him when he says, I and the Father are one. Yeah. If you eat my flesh, you drink my blood. He's talking about if you totally take on who I am into your being. You know, we we say you are what you eat, what you eat, which if that really is true, we say it a lot. We're all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but but Jesus is, is kind of making that point. Like you are what you eat, what you take into yourself. So take in me, yeah. my life, my ministry, what I'm all about. Yeah. And so. But if Jesus isn't God, that doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, I mean, really, it is. It's lunacy to talk like that. You know, is, some guy walked lunacy, up to you on the street right? and said, hey, Cal, if you eat my blood and, and or eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll become just like me. You know, you'd run, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is weird. It's it, it's a really extreme way of speaking, right? Yeah. But you see, I am a son of man, and you are too. But there is a son of man mentioned in Scripture, and the Jews knew when somebody says the son of man, they were speaking about the one in Daniel chapter seven. And so Jesus is is explaining, this is who I am. I'm the one who can approach the throne of God himself. I'm the one who can be in his presence. I'm the one who's being handed over a dominion that's like everlasting, Mm -hmm. the kingdom that has no end, that can never be destroyed. That's who I am. And I'm saying to you, you get up, take your stretcher, and you go home. Mm -hmm. And so this miracle ties all this together. Could you imagine what that room must have been like Mm -hmm. in the house? I'm sure they were shocked. And yeah. well, I'm really sure because our passage talks about it, right? <laughs> so one more question here, Jim. Yeah. How can a person's perceived need open up the chance for God to work and do great things? Yeah, well, I think the best way for me to answer this question is just to kind of share a little bit about my story. And, you know, I, I had this, We, you know, we've talked about this, and I'm sure some watching know that. You know, I, I was raised in, a, in another faith or another denomination of Christian faith, however you want to look at it. But... Um, I didn't really understand my need for a savior. So I kind of went through the motions. But when I, when I got married and started a family, uh, I had this perceived need to live a good moral life, right? Mm-hmm. To, be a, to be a good man, to be a good father, to be a good husband. So like anybody who wants to do that would say, I'll go to church, right? And this will help me meet that, that perceived need. Um, I wasn't thinking anything about my, my real need, which was a need for a savior. Um, but God, again, in his wisdom, addressed the, the much bigger need I had in my life, not the need to be a good man and a good father and a good provider for my family, but the need to be forgiven and the need to recognize my sin, to, re- to confess my sin and to repent of my sin. So, um, again, that's, you know, I, I think that's the answer, you know, as far as me personally, mm-hmm. but God does that all the time, right? People think they need one thing and, um, they, what they really need is Jesus, and and they may he may or may not meet the other need they thought they had, um, mm-hmm. but he will meet the need that they the spiritual need the real need they have, if they are willing to accept what so he kinda, says. So kind of what's so cool is notice how you just described, because this this man came to Jesus believing that that he could heal him, and all props go to that man for having that kind of effort, and and that kind of a commitment to meeting Jesus and his friends as well. I mean, that was great. But notice he came to have the external healed, but Jesus, he addressed the real problem, the internal one, right? And and I got to think too, I mean, maybe 
there might have been a little bit of letdown at, at first, but this guy, right, like, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's great, Jesus, thank you, mm -hmm. but I still can't walk. Yeah. <laughs> right, and maybe he didn't think that. That's how I would have been thinking. I would think, yeah. okay, cool, fine, my sins are forgiven, thanks for that, but what about why? And, and, the, and again, Jesus still met that need. Yeah, but isn't that, right. see, but, but isn't that illustrative of, of, you know, one of the mistakes we can make as Christians? Because you, you, you began to look at issues of like, of an ultimate reality as far as religion and spirituality because you wanted to be a good husband and a good father. Yeah. But that really starts, the, all the external problems really relate to the inner issues that have to be resolved oh, yeah. first, your sin problem. Yeah. And so I know people who they've been very ill, they're dying, and, and they become Christians, they follow Jesus, but they still die. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people that struggle with like, with like substance issues, alcohol, uh, sexual issues, they are sincerely, genuinely pulled towards behaviors that Scripture tells us are not what God wants for them, and they are immoral. And it's a hard life. These behaviors don't, you know, bring the world around you to go. This is great. You should be doing this. So it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. But they, but they have a brokenness that has to be dealt with, right? And so we can sometimes harm them by saying, come to Jesus, it, it will all be okay, mm -hmm. which is true, but it can lead to like an easy, like I, I've had this experience and now I don't, these desires I have for, you know, like immoral sexual behaviors or for drugs or alcohol or for whatever else, for gossip even, yeah. just go away. And that's not how it works. Yeah. You're right, and I think a lot of times we do, that's our fault, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we make these claims that everything will be okay, just, just believe in Jesus. Uh, and like you said, ultimately they will, because one day we're going to be in his presence and, and all that stuff will be behind us. But it doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. And Paul yeah. addressed that throughout, throughout his writings, right? Mm -hmm. these, we're still going to deal with these, these, these present sufferings, but they far outweigh, mm -hmm. or the, the eternal glory far outweighs what we're struggling with now. And so here's the irony with this. The, the irony with this is, is that the, the struggles that we go through now are not worth comparing with the future glory that's going to be revealed in our lives, the resurrection that will happen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heaven and everything else. But Jesus healed this man's outer problem, right, to show us the inner problem that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so we as Christians live out in the outer world the wholeness because of the inner spiritual repair that has happened by the cross of Christ. Jesus, he died for our sins. We believe in Jesus. We have now had our sin problem handled by Jesus Christ. When God looks at my sin, he sees the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He does not see my sin. So now I live out in my world the kind of wholeness that I know has happened to me spiritually and will be completed by God through Jesus one day. So we we Christians are making things whole every day in every way in our lives. We are, we are working our flesh, working our bodies uh, to live for glory for God. We submit ourselves to what God wants, wants to do, and that's kind of this like inverse relationship. Okay, so our final passage in this uh, lesson is Luke 5, verses 25 and 26. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what, had been, what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. Love that. So Jesus heals the man, you know, three commands. You get up, you, you take your stretcher, and you go home, and immediately it happens, right? And so one of, the, um, one of the kind of the realities of this is that we don't speak Greek, okay? So you read this and you go, I get it, Cal. Jesus did something great. Yay, everyone's <laughs> excited and 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 whatnot but see he, here's the deal right this packed house this man gets up and gets out of the house right so you can tell right there the crowd just had to be like dumbstruck mm -hmm. like n no movement and the guy just gets up and walks and mm -hmm. uses the crowd kind of like a like an orange being open just peels open mm -hmm. and uh the man just walks out right mm -hmm. the people were astounded filled with awe meaning they were inspired to revere god to be aware of just the complete majesty and glory of God, right? And the end result of everyone in the room was that they gave glory to God. Everyone, even the Pharisees and the mm. scribes, everyone was kind of like, I don't know how else to, to, 
to explain this other than, wow, this yeah. is crazy, right? Yeah. So we are broken spiritually and physically, and Jesus restores us, and he will carry on this work to completion, right? If we die, we go to heaven. If Jesus returns, he raises the dead and he will make all things new, restore what's broken spiritually in us, but also in our world and most of all between us and our creator. So the consequence of this repair, this bringing of shalom, peace, is that we worship, we glorify God. So let's ask a question and we'll, uh, we'll close up. So Jim, you know, who do you know that needs hope? And this is like a broad, who do you know? Not like, who do you know? What is their SSN, their address, and their blood type? Who do you know that needs hope? And what actions can you take to introduce them to Jesus and that hope? Yeah, I mean, everybody. I know it's a cop-out answer, but everybody needs some hope, mm -hmm. right? Um, and especially now, I think where everyone's just kind of just feeling this malaise, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this low-grade depression that we've been carrying around for the last, <laughs> the last year. Um, and we're all just, we're all in need of hope. And, and the thing is, you know, we laugh about it, but it's okay to, to be a believer, to be a follower of Jesus and to kind of feel down, right? Yeah. Like, Man, I could really just use some hope right now. And I think that's where these types of things are important. Um, your relationships with other believers, um, as far as what actions can you, can we take to introduce them to Jesus? It's just, it's, um, I mean, it's just being real, it's living together, um, well, not living together, but, you know, doing life together. Um, spending time together, encouraging each other, um, and, and most importantly, doing what the friends did and bringing people to Jesus. You know, um, it's probably not going to look like carrying somebody on a on a stretcher, but it can it can look a lot of different ways. It can look like inviting friends or neighbors mm -hmm. over for dinner, mm -hmm. for a cup of coffee. Um, when the weather gets warm, just kind of hanging out in your neighborhood and, and talking, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of making making small talk and, and just community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just being around community, yeah. being around people in in ways that are safe and responsible, but yeah, community, course. right? And community can happen online, right? Yeah. Community can happen by sharing this lesson with some others and saying, Hey, I would love for you to watch this with me. Community can happen once it warms up <laughs> and uh, you can get outside and, and, and you can speak to your neighbors and your friends. All church really is, is a community of people who have been changed by Jesus Christ. That's what it is, right? And so community happens when believers in Jesus are gathered together. Community happens when you make the conscious choice to be with others. So just kind of closing things up. What are the times in life where we can look back and say that Jesus, he did an amazing work in your life or in the work of, or in, the, or in like a loved one's life? And so how did that impact how you understood Jesus? I'll just kind of start this off and say, yeah, sure. it's, it's when I experience hard things, right? It's when I go through pain. It's not when things are going really well. It's when I go through pain. It's when I don't understand why things have happened a certain way. It's when I'm broken. It's when I feel loss. It is in those times that I'm made aware about who Jesus is, what he really does, and how there really aren't answers on this earth to the deepest problems that humans have. Yeah. There, it just isn't the case. And so I don't want anyone to go through bad things. But look at this man here. God used the bad thing in his life to bring him to Jesus. Yeah. God used that. And that's what's happening in your life. So do you run from pain? And I'm not saying you're like a, you're like a masochist and you embrace pain. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is when you experience pain, do you consciously acknowledge what it is and why it's happening and what God may be doing through it. Yeah. And scripture does tell us to, to rejoice in our sufferings, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, we shouldn't look for it, but when it, when they come, we should realize that God's doing his work mm -hmm. through those sufferings. I think along the same lines with this, you know, sometimes we see those really cool, like immediate transformation stories, but I think more often than not, it, it's kind of a gradual thing, but we can still see God working that, right? So like in, in student ministry, I see a lot of students that, you know, I, I see we, we, both of us in our positions have the opportunity to share the gospel and to, to, to introduce people to Jesus. But what, to me, is what's really cool is when you see somebody over the period of time, over a period of time, mm. you see them, God changing their lives. Because, yeah, we do have those, those instant, right, get up and carry your mat and go home. Mm. But I think more than that, it's, the, it's this process of sanctification, right? So, when I, for example, I see a student who, like, wouldn't even pray 
in a, in a group, mm -hmm. you know, and with a couple of years, they're coming to me saying, hey, I want to lead a Bible study in a group, mm -hmm. right? To me, that's like evidence of God doing really cool stuff. And we see that in adults also, you know, people mm -hmm. who are just really kind of on the fringes and all of a sudden you're like, wow, this guy is like doing cool stuff for, for Jesus. Um, so yeah, there is that, that immediate life change, but I think more often than not, it's a, it's a process and you get to see people over the course of time grow closer to Jesus and start doing stuff for his kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. When you see the inner change expressed yeah. outwardly yeah. and you see growth occur and, and, and like how a Christian behaves and what they do, it's a really encouraging yeah. thing. It's addictive. Even. Yeah. Huh. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us this week. And just a reminder, this whole lesson was about Jesus has the power to forgive sin. We thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.